So we are now kind of moving to um, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Purcell from University of Cardiff. And she will give us a perspective of what children actually kind of perceive and how their perception is kind of influencing their actions, particularly within the kind of street scene and the public realm. Because I think we all are aware that our design decisions um, are pretty much driven from our own perspectives and what we see, although we try to kind of embrace different perspectives, different views, um, I think fully understanding what a child actually kind of sees and perceives and the limitations as well um, is, is quite hard. So over to, to you, Catherine, and to your presentation. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm just going to share my, my slides with you. So just give me one second while I do that. Great, so thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me um, to speak this morning. Um, so um, as, as Katya said, uh, I'm a senior lecturer at Cardiff University. Um, I've been doing research in the field of um, perception action in the context of road crossing for about 12 years now. Um, and what I'm going to focus on, there are three components really to being able to safely navigate our environments. Um, the, fir the first is the environment, which we've, we've heard, we've heard, we've heard some very interesting discussion about. Uh, the second is the task, and, and the third is the is the individual. And those three things have to align uh, optimally in order to promote um, safe travel. So I'm going to focus on the task of the individual this morning. Um, so, when we look to, to, to cross a road, we do it naturally. As, as an adult, as a kind of typically developing adult, we're very adept at uh, safely crossing roads most of the time. We do make errors, but on the whole, we don't necessarily put a lot of conscious effort into the activity of, or the task of road crossing. But actually, what we're asking children to do is an incredibly complex uh, task. So the first thing that we have to do when we stand by the side of the road is we have to detect whether or not there is vehicles on the road. So we, we might have to scan the visual scene. We have to avoid distractions. Um, we have to stand in a suitable place. Um, we have to um, think about uh, the, the, the environment. The second thing we have to do, and we're asking our children to do, is to make visual timing judgments. So this basically requires us to determine which direction the vehicle's traveling in, uh, how fast it's traveling, and how far away it is. And if we are not able to make those judgments, then the task of road crossing suddenly becomes incredibly, um, incredibly difficult. And we use that information to make a decision as to whether we've got time to get from one side of the road to the other side of the road. Once we've done that, we then have to try and coordinate that information from multiple directions, assuming we're crossing a, a two-way two street. Um, it's very rare that as pedestrians, we only have to look either right or left. And this comes back to the, the design and the environment. Um, we often are crossing roads in the UK, certainly, that, are, that have cars coming from both directions. So we have to coordinate that information. And then finally, we have to coordinate our perception and action. So that means that we have to try and coordinate that all of that, assimilate all of that information, and then relate that to our motor capability. So our ability to, to walk from one side of the road to the other within a suitable time gap that will enable us to make that crossing without being hit by a car or a vehicle. And it's that last bit that I'm really going to focus on today. Um, but before I do, I think it's, it's always worth um, reminding ourselves what happens when we get this wrong. So there are, I'm sure you're all aware, but just I think it's always worth reminding ourselves why are we here this morning? What is the driving force behind this? Um, so there are 1.3 million people that die as a result of preventable road traffic collisions each year, and it's predicted to rise. 
So um, it's predicted that road, preventable road traffic injuries will result in about 2.4 million deaths annually. And there's clearly and, and, and sadly a human cost to these to behind these figures. But as well as the human cost, the economic cost is, is huge and is thought to be about 3% of gross national product. And children are known as a particularly vulnerable group, along with, uh, along with cyclists, motorcyclists um, and horse riders, are known as particularly vulnerable groups on our, on our roads. And we know that um, preventable road traffic accidents are the second largest cause of death for children between age, uh, age between 5 and 14 years worldwide. So this is, a, this is a global challenge. And we also know that um, in the UK, from the latest-ish figures, around 24% of all preventable pedestrian collisions were children under the age of 15. So they are a very vulnerable group at our roadside. And that's exacerbated when we think about the population of children under, age, under the age of 15, which is only 19% in the UK. So that just emphasises how more at risk uh, children are uh, in the task of road crossing. And of course, we need to ask ourselves then, so why are children so vulnerable on our roads? And this is a, a picture of a, of a friend of mine um, with, with her child. Um, and what you can see here is that she, as, as any parent probably would, is naturally crossing the road with her child to the left. So she's holding her child's hand and she's crossing the road. Um, and what immediately strikes me about this picture, I think this is an incredibly, incredibly powerful picture, because what immediately strikes me is that it's mum here that's making the judgment. So the child is, doesn't have a clear view of the, of the street. Mum is making the judgment. And I think that that happens an awful lot. And, I, and I, I think that's completely understandable. So that then led me to um, think about what would happen if children were making that judgment? What, what would happen if, if the child was on the right and the child was, was, asking, was, was being asked that question, um, do you have time to cross? Simple question. And of course, we're talking about children so far as if they're a homogenous group, and of course they're not. There are children who have significant differences. So for example, children with developmental coordination disorder, um, which we know affects five to 6% of children in the UK. And this isn't a childhood disorder, <clears throat> this, is a, this, is a, this is a lifelong disorder. And we know that there's a, a huge overlap with uh, developmental coordination disorder, also known as dyspraxia, uh, more commonly, with things like autism, ADHD, etc. So a lot of my research is focused both on um, what, what we could consider kind of typically developing children, but also children that have a, a motor difficulty that um, might hamper that final judgment that we need to make when we're standing by the roadside in terms of, do I have time? to get from this side of the road to that side of the road in the time available. <coughs> so, there is a perceptual challenge at the roadside. So we already know that judging the speed of oncoming vehicles is one of the leading factors contributing to this overrepresentation over of children in pedestrian accident accidents. And I've published research that suggests that children um, demonstrate what's known as an increased size bias. So that's where smaller vehicles are often seen, and we, we're all susceptible to this, this isn't just children, um, but smaller vehicles are perceived as traveling slower than larger vehicles. I've also published research that looks at the ability to detect, so that first kind of element, the ability to detect a vehicle is approaching, and have found that <clears throat> actually if vehicles are traveling at speeds faster than around 20 miles an hour, children may misperceive them as being stationary. And then I've also looked at children with developmental coordination disorder or dyspraxia, and actually their ability to detect vehicles as approaching um, is significantly poorer than uh, kind of age and gender matched um, peers. So that if, they're if, if vehicles are traveling at speeds in excess of about 14 miles an hour, they may, may misperceive those speeds. They may, sorry, misperceive those vehicles as being stationary. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> and then I've done some research looking at that ability to make that judgment as to which, which vehicle is going to reach me first. And again, children with DCD are um, significantly poorer at making that judgment. Children are poorer than adults, but adults still make errors. So what I want to focus on for the kind of rest of this, this, um, this brief kind of talk is this idea that if crossing time, if it's going to take me longer to cross the road than the time I have, then a collision is going to occur. And we already know from previous research, very old research now, which is still, still appropriate, still valid, that as adults, we tend to use that combination of distance and speed in order to judge whether the gap available is, is large enough. That time gap between vehicles is large enough. And we know that from previous research that typically developing children tend to rely on distance rather than speed. So they might look down the road and they might say that vehicle's so far away that I've got time to cross. But of course, if that vehicle is traveling at 60 miles an hour, that significantly reduces their crossing time. And we, so I, I ran an experiment um, where we measured whether children with DCD are, are accurately able, so typically developing children and children with, with developmental coordination disorder or dyspraxia are accu accurately able to select a crossing gap that provided them sufficient time to get from one side of the road to the other side of the road. And I varied the approach speed between 20, 30 and 40 miles an hour and looked at that crossing gap that children were prepared to accept. And I set up a fairly simple experiment where I had three screens, um, a virtual environment. Uh, children were presented with um, this kind of three screens. The, the, the two screens were angled, so they, they felt like they were immersed in the environment. And vehicles either approached from, from the right or from, from both sides. And I, and I asked a simple question, do you have time to cross? And I used a, a, in the background, there was a, what's known as a psychophysical procedure so that the crossing gaps, the, the time between the vehicles varied depending on the children's response. And that, that's done automatically by a piece of computer programming. And what we found was that, um, so along the horizontal axis here, I'm looking at one lane. So that was where uh, vehicles were only approaching from the right at speeds of either 20, 30 or 40 miles an hour. And then the, the second element of that is vehicles were approaching from both the right and the left, again at 20 and 30 and 40 miles an hour. And then along the vertical axis, I'm looking at the, the, um, the crossing time. So that point at which children said, yeah, I would still be able to cross. And um, what we found is that for typically developing children at lower speeds, so at 20 miles an hour and even just about 30 miles an hour, children were making sensible crossing gaps. They were selecting sensible cr crossing gaps in the one lane and two lane conditions. But as soon as vehicle speed started to increase uh, to 40 miles an hour, even typically developing children, these, are, these were primary school age children, were starting to make errors. They were starting to select crossing gaps that would have resulted in collision if they'd actually been at the roadside and made that judgment. And then for our children with DCD or, or dyspraxia, Actually, even at lower speeds, at 20 miles an hour, they were still selecting crossing gaps that would have resulted in collision had they made those decisions at the roadside. So here we have a, a clear perceptual error. There wasn't a motor component in this, in this task. Um, so this is purely on a, based on a perceptual judgment that suggests that children can only cope with certain speeds on our roads and suggests that for some children, even those speeds may be too... Um, maybe too great. So the conclusion really is that primary school age children do tend to rely on distance rather than that ratio between distance and speed, because that graph can be explained by children picking a point in the distance <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me and ignoring the speed of the vehicle. Um, this would result in potential collision for vehicles approaching at 40 miles an hour for our, for our typically developing primary school age children. And for those children that have motor difficulties, so those children with dyspraxia or developmental coordination disorder, actually they were sufficient, they were selecting insufficient time gaps between vehicles, um, even when speeds were, were around 20 or, or 30 miles an hour. So that then makes us think about going back to the environment, 
what speeds can children cope with in the roads surrounding their environment? Um, in the kind of latest project that I was involved in or that I, that I, ra that I ran, um, I, one of the challenges is that, that this is all quite negative. And a lot of the schools that I was working with, uh, I kept taking back this, this negative message. And eventually they kind of said to me, the head teacher said to me, so right, what are you going to do about it? Which is a very, very good question. Um, so um, last year I developed a uh, virtual reality game. So it's a it's a it's a tablet based game. So it's it's you can use it on or using through the Apple Store. You can download it. It's called Virtual Road World, and it certainly doesn't solve the problem. But what it does do is it provides children with an opportunity to practice safe crossing. So selecting safe crossing uh, um, locations and selecting safe gaps between vehicles in a virtual world. Um, and that's kind of all I wanted to, to cover today. So I'm happy to, to take any questions if there's time. Otherwise, um, I would say thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Catherine. I think that was a very, very kind of important um, presentation you've given us and really made clear about the difference of perceptions between the adults and the children.